Um, uh, thank you all very much for coming. I'm Helen Margitz, um, Director of the Oxford um, Internet Institute. Um, so this conference is the third Internet Policy and Politics Conference. We've, uh, for, for, for those of you who haven't been here before, and though I can see there are some people here who have, have been before, we've held this conference every two years since uh, 2010, and we hope to do so well into the future. Um, there's round about 100 of, of you here, at least that's the capacity of this lecture theatre, so I hope there's not very many more. Um, it's also well under the um, average number of Facebook friends, um, the average number of Facebook friends that most people have, and we consider that to be a really nice size for this type of, of conference, because theoretically it should allow, um, I mean literally, theoretically, it should allow um, you all to sort of interact with each other. Now, for anybody who doesn't know, um, the Oxford Internet Institute that has organised this conference, um, I'm the director of the Oxford Internet Institute. We're a department here at the University of Oxford. We were founded in 2001, um, basically to research and study life online, all aspects of the Internet's um, relationship with society. Um, we're a growing department. We're no longer the smallest department of Oxford. Obviously, we were when we started, but now we're bigger than some departments, I'm pleased to say, growing all the time. Um, and uh, we have a master's program in the social science of the internet and a DPhil program in um, uh, information, communication, and social science. Um, I think we're an interesting department because we're a multidisciplinary department. Um, and when I say that, I really, really mean it. So we are in the social sciences division. We were formed in the social sciences division. I'm a political scientist. My colleagues are uh, sociologists, economists, geographers. We have a professor of law, a professor of philosophy, um, uh, right across the gamut, anthropologists, right across the, the, the gamut of disciplines, but also um, into other uh, other areas outside the social sciences, like a professor of philosophy, also um, specialists in computer science, um, even physics. I, actually, I don't know why I'm saying even physics when we've got an astrophysicist as our, um, as our keynote speaker um, starting soon. But what I'm, what I'm trying to express um, is that we believe that that kind of multidisciplinary mix um, methods, techniques, expertise, understanding, and theoretical frameworks from all those disciplines um, is, 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 is needed to study um, public policy after just 15 years after um, widespread use of the internet. And I think many of the people here would sort of share that feeling that, um, yes, we're in the division of, of, of social science, but that doesn't mean that we can't, um, that we don't need things that have traditionally been in the humanities, um, <laughs> history, for example, or the medical and physical and life sciences. Um, I think this is a really kind of interesting challenge for social, um, social science in the next 15 years of the internet, now that so much of life takes place online. Um, can we understand it with our, our traditional techniques? So that's one of the reasons why in 2009 we took on the editor editorship of the Policy and Internet um, Journal, which you should all have been given a copy of. Actually, this is a, a special copy um, produced for the conference, printed for the conference. Actually, we exist only in the virtual world normally, but this is just to show we do know what a printed thing looks like. Um, and. Uh, when we created it, this, this journal looks at the relationship between the internet and policy. It tries to understand the kind of changing nature of public policy um, in, in, in the digital world. And we felt that it had, had to be a multidisciplinary um, journal. That gives us a number of challenges. We're just planning to um, go for getting indexed. Um, and, you know, it's a real challenge. What, discipline do we try and get index under? Um, we should probably be trying for, for two and three disciplines. Everything's more difficult um, being multidisciplinary, but, but we believe that it's worth the challenge. So this conference is organised on, on behalf of the journal. 
um, to generate discussion and scholarship into one trend that we believe each, each time we have the conference we focus in on one trend that we believe, an internet based trend that we believe will have profound implications for politics and policy. So this time we've selected crowdsourcing, um, if anybody um, is really interested in practical cognition, then they should really be at the conference down the <laughs> corridor. Um, I'm trusting that everybody's um, in the right place. Um, and, you know, this idea that small acts by large numbers of people can scale up to do the kind of things that we used to think only um, long-standing organisations and institutions could do. Um, that's one of the really um, exciting internet phenomena which has ramifications right across policy sectors and has ramifications right across disciplines. So that's the idea of this first panel, which we're going to just turn to, um, this plenary panel, which we're going to turn to in a minute, where we try and think of some of the possibilities of crowdsourcing and some of the dangers in the different sectors that the panelists are, are experts in. I guess some of this um, will be a question of definition. I don't know about anybody else, but I have a tendency to fall into the same track as, trap as the uh, schoolboy who was accused of uh, uh, using, uh, getting other people to do his homework and saying to the teacher, cheating's a harsh word. Um, I prefer to call it crowdsourcing. Um, I, I, I must say that I, feel, I, I, I tend to fall into that category and think of a lot of things of crowdsourcing that perhaps aren't. So perhaps during these two days, we can tease out some of the things that actually really are distinctive and interesting um, about crowdsourcing um, and, and, again, uh, their implications. Um, and also, perhaps, to think about kind of when crowdsourcing works and when crowdsourcing doesn't work. I mean, on the one hand, I don't know about you, but I feel very excited by the idea that I could go onto two or three social media platforms and kind of crowdsource... Um, I, I, I don't know, some piece of information um, that I don't actually know um, rather than um, looking it up or, or, or looking it up and, and getting some sort of added value in that information from so doing. Um, but actually, I remember having this feeling um, on Facebook a few weeks ago and um, uh, putting in, you know, does anybody know of a chimney sweep? Because there was soot coming out of my my uh, chimney and uh, absolutely nobody made any comment or any reply or <laughs> gave me anything and I think that isn't important to re remember certainly in my own field um, looking at collective action um, we're finding that so many initiatives kind of fail rather than actually get anywhere and I think that's something to remember most crowdsourcing in in initiatives um, probably fail so what's what's important um, with the ones that succeed anyway that's what we're going to be talking about for the next two days um, I just want to do some sort of introductions and, and thank yous and a small housekeeping point before we move to the, uh, move to the panel. Um, so it's been a good couple of years for the journal. Since the last conference, we have um, two new uh, editors for the journal. One is Willy Lidenvieter, who's here on the panel. The other is Jonathan Bright, who's over there. I'm sure you'll, you'll meet them in the course of the next um, couple of days. Uh, we lost uh, this year our other editor, Sandra gonzalez Bayon. She's gone to um, an excellent new position at the Annenberg School in Pennsylvania. Um, it's the new term. She'd be with us now, but it's the new term there. She's just starting term, so she couldn't make it. But she's kind of virtually here because she reminded me to tell everybody um, to tweet on the IPP uh, 2014 hashtag, um, and then she'll know what's going on. Um, so please don't forget to do that, um, IPP 2014. Um, we've... Uh, just at the time of the last conference, we were just in the process of transferring over to our new publisher, that's Wiley Blackwell. Um, the um, editor of all the 717 journals is here, Brian Giblin. We're very pleased to see him here. We're really happy to be um, with, with Wiley Blackwell as a publisher. Um, we believe the journal will go to strength, and, uh, strength to strength, including the application for indexing. Um, that's one of the reasons why we really hope you will all submit your, your papers here at this conference. Um, to the journal, some sort of you've, you've already had some um, selective process um, applied to your papers, so we can promise you a, a, a fast track reviewing process. Um, and consider it for your future work. The other thing that happened this year is we set up a blog. It's called the Policy, just Google Policy and Internet blog. I hope some of you have seen it. 
Um, but the blog is, is proving a really nice venue um, for work looking at the relationship between the internet and policy. Um, we make sure that there are blogs about all the articles uh, that we publish, but do, uh, if you haven't got time to write an article, write a blog post um, for, 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 for the blog um, and uh, interact in that way. Um, then to the thank yous, I'd like to thank um, the Internet and Politics uh, Standing Group of the European Consortium of Political Research, represented here by Andrea Calderado, who is the convener of the group and um, on our panel. Um, the CPR uh, Standing Group has collaborated in this conference since the start. Um, I re I'm a political scientist, as I said. I remember it used to be that considering any sort of relationship between um, politics or indeed sociology or other disciplines and anything to do with technology was a very, very sad thing to do and nobody really wanted to talk to you very much. Um, and if there was a panel on that at a conference, there'd be about three or four people um, who you were either related to or had been friends with for a very long time. Now, sessions at the ECPR on anything to do with internet, politics, social media are flooded out. I think it's fair to say it's turning into one of the biggest sections. Um, we've seen a real sea change and indication of the huge importance of this field. I'd like to say um, thank you very much to the Policy Studies Organisation, um, who owns the journal Policy and Internet. His president, Paul Rich, is um, here in the front row, and also Executive Director, uh, Daniel Gutierrez Sandoval. Um, we'd like to thank you for all you do for, for the journal and for sponsoring this conference. We'd also like to say thank you to the American Public University System, who have also um, uh, uh, made generous sponsorship of this conference. Um, and they're represented here by the Provost, um, Karen Powell, also in the, in, in the front row, Wally Boston, the President, um, and Phil Ice, I think, also um, is here from APU. Um, uh, in your welcome packs, um, you all have an umbrella. That's something we've done since the beginning of the conference. I've always been anxious to get some money for umbrellas because um, Oxford in the rain is really horrible. And if it rains when you're here and you haven't got an umbrella, you're going to have unkind feelings about us, which would be a shame. <laughs> um, in previous years, the umbrellas have been a reasonably successful um, way of stopping it raining um, because it's <laughs> quite a long process and, and they're quite, quite expensive getting the umbrellas and everything. I, I hope it's going to work this year. I don't know, the sky's a bit dodgy. But anyway, you've got your umbrellas. And I want to say thank you to um, the PSA a PSO and the APU for that because some of my colleagues said oh we don't need to have umbrellas everyone's got an umbrella they're bored of umbrellas and I said no please Paul can we have umbrellas and anyway they sponsored them so <laughs> thank you for that um, I hope it works for tomorrow but we'll see just a few more um, housekeeping um, uh, uh, points um, uh, on Friday we'll be using seminar room one in addition to the rooms being used today um, so just remember that um, there's a map in your conference packs and people will direct you to it, but it is in a slightly different part of the college. Um, there's fire assembly points on that map as well. Um, wireless network codes are in the delicate packs. Please select um, the network OWL, which is the University um, Oxford network. I don't know why it's called OWL, actually. It's just occurred to me. Um, Tea and coffee and lunch are going to be held in the foyer outside the lecture theatre where, where lunch was today, for those of you who had it. Um, we do have, and we always have at this conference, had receptions um, rather than formal dinners because we do feel that that maximises the number of people um, that you are able to talk with and meet. And then if we have a formal dinner, then you may talk an awful lot to just two or three people um, who you... Anyway, um, so that's what we do. But just to tell you, in case you're, you're arriving at the Ashmolean expecting a formal dinner, it's not that. It's a reception. There will be food, um, you know, generous canapes, but it won't be a formal dinner. So if you're really hungry, you need to go out to dinner. <laughs> they end at 9 tonight um, and 8.30 um, tomorrow night. We try to pick nice Oxford venues. It's in um, the Ashmolean tonight and the Natural History Museum um, tomorrow. If you have any questions or need any help with anything, um, please find somebody um, with an orange badge. Those are people from the Oxford Internet Institute who will help you uh, find what you need. Um, for, for reasons um, buried in, in, in the start of the year when we thought everything was possible, 
Um, we, it, it turned out that we were going to move from uh, the Oxford Internet Institute is growing. We have a second site um, which is moving from Banbury Road, 66 Banbury Road, 34 St Giles, which is a long way in Oxford terms. Um, and uh, that move is obviously taking up quite a few people's time. We're trying to pretend that that's not happening and you hope you won't notice that. But um, just, just to let you know, if anybody feels a bit, seems a bit stressed, that would, that would be why. But there should be plenty of, of people around. Um, to help you. Uh, I'd like to thank very much, finally, our keynote speakers, Chris um, Lintard, who's here, and you, 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 you will be hearing from soon, and also Mary Gray, who I think is here. I don't know, but anyway, is, is definitely coming to the conference, um, and, and we'll be closing the conference with her, her key, co keynote talk. Um, so unless anybody has any burning questions or anything, I would like now to turn to the opening um, panel, um, which will uh, be quite short. I mean, really picking up on what I said earlier about crowdsourcing kind of um, touching every, uh, every one of our fields, both in terms of how we perceive um, a policy sector or, or, or the topic of a discipline, the social political or economic world, um, and also how we do research, actually, for many of us um, uh, in, in, in many areas, actually how we're doing research could involve um, something that would definitely fall into the um, category of crowdsourcing. Um, so I hope that each of these people, and I'll, I'll introduce them in a second, um, will highlight some of the some of the kind of benefits of, 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 of crowdsourcing in the area in which they work, and also perhaps hint to some of the, some of the dangers. Um, I think in, in every area um, there are kind of hidden or certainly perceived um, um, dangers. Um, uh, for example, market, marketization and the erosion of workers' right from micro-labor, which can be, a very, can be a very real danger but also um, threats to traditional institutions, which may be a, 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 real, a real danger or may be change waiting to happen. I think it's important to kind of confront these dangers and think about the extent to which they really are a bad thing. Anyone who was in, in um, London um, the day that uh, the black taxis of London protested against um, Uber coming to London will have really seen that, to have seen the whole of Westminster jammed with black taxi cabs who decided to paralyse the city to avoid um, Uber coming to London um, will have seen that confrontation very, very directly. But it's, you know, it's something worth thinking about. Is that really, uh, you, you know, is that such a, is that such a, 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 a terrible thing? Thank, to the taxi companies, it cert certainly was. Anyway, I'll move on to introduce our speakers. We have um, Willi leiden Vierter. He is an economic sociologist and research fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute. His areas of expertise are virtual goods, virtual currencies, and digital labor. It was actually his idea that we should have the conference on crowdsourcing, so you have him to thank um, for that. And he's at, uh, the author of Virtual Economies, just out with MIT Press. Andrea Calderero, as I said, is a convener of the UCPR group. He is a researcher at the Centre for Media Freedom and Media Pluralism at the European University Institute. He focuses on um, the internet and international politics, with a particular focus on internet governance, cybersecurity, digital rights, and freedom. Uh, Rebecca Einan um, is an educational sociologist. She's an associate professor um, here at the OII, but also in the Department of Education at Oxford, one of the joint appointments, a, a, a way of sort of enshrining um, relationships with other departments that we are, we are fostering here. Um, she, her research focuses on education, learning, and inequality. She's going to talk about crowds, learning, by, learning with crowds. Um, and she's the author of um, Teenagers and Technology, which came out um, with Routledge in 2013. And finally, Dieter Zinbauer um, is a senior, programmer, uh, s uh, senior program manager on emerging policy, policy issues um, at uh, uh, Transparency International. Um, and he's going to talk about, perhaps from more from a practitioner's perspective, um, what crowdsourcing can do 
um, for anti-corruption and transparency. Um, so they're all going to talk for five to seven minutes, I think was what, I, <laughs> what we said. Um, so I, I, I guess I will um, hand over to Billy first. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, I'm very pleased to see all of you here. A very nice crowd, many friends and new acquaintances as well. Um, I trust everyone can hear me all right. Yep. Yeah. So, I'm, so as mentioned, I'm an economic sociologist. So I'd like to talk about crowdsourcing from the perspective of the economy and markets. So if you think about the original definition of crowdsourcing that was put forward by Jeff Howey in 2005, he said that crowdsourcing is the outsourcing of a task that was previously conducted by a staff member or a contractor to a large undefined group of people, typically over the internet. So already that definition was kind of very economic in nature because it talked about outsourcing, it talked about contractors and so on. And now today kind of examples of crowdsourcing in the economy that have become very prominent are obviously things that uh, Helen also referred to like um, uh, Uber, an app that connects people who need a ride with people who are willing to provide a ride uh, uh, for a fee, or things like Airbnb that allows people who have a room or a flat free to rent it out to visitors on a nightly basis. And these are obviously also referred to with another buzzword, the sharing economy, right? Then you have things like online work platforms, things like Odesk. As I speak here, I have a, a Kenyan uh, a contractor, um, a graduate student in Nairobi, uh, inputting my uh, publications into SSRN. Um, so uh, this is an example of how people are now companies as well as individuals outsourcing little tasks um, over the internet to people, uh, to other people for a fee. And then finally, you can, if you really want to expand the definition, you can even think of things like Bitcoin and new virtual currencies as sort of uh, crowdsourced uh, uh, money um, in opposition to uh, government-sponsored currencies. Now, what then, so if we have all these examples of, of um, uh, crowdsourcing in the economy, why are they happening? What's the driving force there? Well, one very simple explanation from economics would be that information and communication technologies are driving down transaction costs related to contracting with other people. And that's making it feasible, financially viable, to um, outsource work in smaller and smaller components to a larger and larger number of people and to seek uh, contributions of funding, investment uh, in smaller and smaller chunks from larger and larger numbers of people. So crowdfunding obviously is also part of this phenomenon. And uh, so this way you can build an argument that the crowdsourcing um, is actually allowing resources in society to be allocated more efficiently. Thanks to lower transaction costs, resources can now be allocated in an increasingly fine-grained way. And that's what we then perceive as crowdsourcing in the economy. But um, there is another side to this story as well, um, because even if we didn't have any transaction costs involved um, in, in contracting things, would we still necessarily want to replace every institution and every hierarchy and organization in society with the market? So, in, in some cases, Probably yes, but then there are other cases, um, and I'm going to give a couple of examples where perhaps not. So, uh, for example, science funding. Georgia Tech 
uh, in the United States has started their own uh, crowdfunding website for research projects. So scientists can sign up on this site and uh, pitch their project to the crowd with photos and with videos and with perks to those, you know, you give $20 and um, uh, you get a little project badge, give over a hundred and you get to take part in a live Q&A with the scholar and so on and so on. Um, and you know, for a thousand or something, you get acknowledged in the the paper, um, uh, or I don't know, maybe you could sell co-authorships as well. <laughs> um, and they're doing this. They've they've said that they're doing this very explicitly in response to the dwindling taxpayer money that is being funneled to science. That they're unable to get as much money as they were used to be able to get. Um, through government channels to research committees. So now they're basically creating a market to um, make up for that loss. But are these me me mechanisms of funding science equivalent? Obviously, a mar in a market-based system, some kinds of projects are going to fare better than others. In ordinary science funding, we have this idea that the, the power taxpayers uh, delegate their power to fund science to certain experts who are better positioned to choose which projects de deliver value to the public and which don't. And more generally, there's the argument that markets are not very good at producing public goods. And many types of science tend to be a public good rather than a private good. So. For these reasons, it's not always clear that even if we want, even if we're able to crowdsource things and turn things into a market, that we always ought to be doing so, that that replacement uh, is as good or as better than the previous arrangement that it's uh, replacing. So that's basically my, my perspective to crowdsourcing in economics. There are immense uh, possibilities of allocating resources more efficiently, innovating, uh, creating dynamic uh, systems and organizations to replace rigid hierarchies. But there are also dangers of this kind of neoliberalization where every kind of enduring institution that we've built into society is replaced with simply a market. And that doesn't always deliver all the goods that we that we want in society. Thank you. Andrea, some people, you, you might say that politics is one of the fields where you know we've, we've always been doing crowdsourcing. I mean, the idea of voting, for example, is, 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 could surely lay claim to be a sort of crowdsourcing. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that's absolutely correct. I mean, I, think, I feel that I have here the, the toughest job here to try to find in five minutes to talk about uh, uh, crowdsourcing and politics because indeed crowdsourcing is kind of uh, saying it's the same that saying internet and, and politics it's basically we've been interested in, uh, in internet exactly because it allows people to 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 bring together to be easily engaged in, in political uh, processes and policy processes and so on so I think everybody would agree here with me that we basically, we were interested in the relation between crowdsourcing and politics even before that actually the, the, the word, the label was coined itself, which was of course more recent. So I think that uh, we already uh, were looking, we've been interested in crowdsourcing uh, since the very beginning when we were uh, produced a lot of research on, uh, on how uh, people were able to, through the internet, uh, through crowdsourcing practices, and that were not called crowdsourcing, practices uh, in, 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 uh, in forms of political participations, in campaign especially, there is a huge uh, research on that, uh, and uh, I mean, stealing a concept from the economist, uh, uh, the crowdfunding as well. So and this arrived basically in the, I would say that the peak of research in the field was with the Obama campaign, and that um, all uh, that our American colleagues had a lot of fun to give a lot of empirical evidence on the impact that crowdfunding crowdsourcing had in, in campaigning. On another level, we can spend some words on the social movements that uh, were pioneer in experimenting new forms of, uh, of uh, uh, through the internet, new forms of uh, coordination to engage people, but also many mobilization were actually clustered their political agenda on the outcomes of crowdsourcing itself. 
like the free software movement, for example. So, and this was uh, what we've been studying for, for, for quite a long time, and uh, there are still, of course, a lot of work to do here. But um, I also think that uh, now, I mean, more recently, we, um, the, the narrowing of the digital divide that expanded the crowd. And uh, this means that uh, uh, more people, not only in terms of, of number, I mean, more people are now accessing the internet, but also across uh, 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 geographies. So this means that the crowdsourcing are increasingly used in uh, across political contexts in countries with uh, uh, limit I mean, or in political transitions or in uh, under autocratic regimes. And here I think that we can see uh, many new uh, forms uh, of uh, interesting forms of crowdsourcing that need uh, to be further for their um, research. So I'm also referring when we talk about the crowdsourcing and international politics of the impact that crowdsourcing practices are having in the in reshuffling also this uh, big uh, concept uh, typical of uh, international studies like the global governance where uh, that has been a concept that has been so far until really recently uh, attached to the um, coordination among the state agency actors, uh, NGO, international organizations through mobile phones, uh, through exactly with the narrowing of the digital divide. Uh, now uh, crowdsourcing practices are influencing, are makes citizens able to interact with this big global governance uh, uh, discourse. And in this case, we can mention the internet governance debate, for example, is uh, also because of crowdsourcing practices are increasingly able to make the, multi the famous multi-stakeholder approach uh, trying to be a bit more uh, efficient, still doubt whether there will be finally a success on that, but at least they are trying. And um, on a different level, we also have examples of uh, the role that cross-sourcing has in uh, um, conflict management. Conflict management is, uh, is another huge uh, uh, example where people now finally, in the case of Mushahidi, uh, people are able to, thanks for the mo with a mobile phone, to just interact, uh, to communicate what exactly is happening on the ground in their own context and, uh, and helping the people that uh, are in the condition to manage the conflict, uh, to uh, well, find a solution is too optimistic, but anyway, to intervene uh, to, in some way, coordinate exactly what, this is, what exactly is happening. So this exactly is the present. I want to leave you with uh, some, uh, something about the future or some exactly criticism or some more words on the threats that crowdsourcing exactly can bring as well. Because uh, crowdsourcing uh, is also a way to expose people on the ground uh, to some threats. Give visibility means also that they are exposed to some threats, and especially uh, referring to the to the um, to the point that uh, now crowdsourcing is a practice that is used in uh, different com political contexts uh, in uh, limited uh, uh, democracies, for example, uh, crowdsourcing can be also a way to it have opportunities, but also threats for the people that are using crowdsourcing. So the um, privacy privacy is very important. So every time we we, we refer to crowdsourcing, we have to refer also on the on the on the threats in terms of privacy, and uh, it would be great uh, to see in the in the Imminent future, more research on that is still, of course, it's already developing uh, quickly, but of course, we need more research on that. And um, so, this, of course, I mean, it was my challenge it was to provide this different perspective and to see that we can do this from a past, present, and future research in the field, that the perspective that we can look at crowdsourcing. And um, I, I mean, I think that in a way, this is already clear uh, on the, looking at the program of this conference that is so diverse, and because exactly cross-sourcing and politics and policy processes so diverse and uh, I think the program makes a great job in looking at this uh, relation from a different perspective. Thank you. Great, thanks Andrea. Rebecca, let's delve into the work policy area. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so in the area of learning and education, um, there are quite a wide range of examples of crowdsourcing. So for example, encouraging teachers to share resources to improve their classroom practice, to encouraging people to come together to solve key educational policy and practice issues, to crowdfunding for supporting those who can't afford to access higher education, for example. But the area that I care most about is the kinds of crowdsourcing initiatives where there is a direct um, uh, focus on supporting and facilitating learning. Um, so, for example, initiatives that encourage children to participate in scientific experiments or provide people a way of learning a new language or solving a data science problem, um, while at the same time, of course, ensuring that the um, initiators of that crowdsourcing initiative get the data or the, sol the solution or the transcription that they're looking for at the same time. 
But that said, I think um, it would be useful for us to think about a whole um, range of other crowdsourcing initiatives as a kind of um, having a learning focus. So things like um, creating cultural goods like music or film or tagging um, cultural artefacts or crowdsourcing for public policy, even though um, learning isn't a direct focus of those initiatives, learning can occur. And the reason that I argue that is because even though it's very hard to generalise and crowdsourcing is an incredibly diverse range of different things, essentially what we're asking people to do is to kind of create some kind of knowledge. And if we're asking people to kind of create some kind of knowledge, then essentially we're looking, from an education perspective at least, at the process of learning. And so what I would like to suggest is an interesting angle for further research in terms of education is to think about how we can optimise crowdsourcing initiatives to kind of borrow ideas from learning theory. And so while it's important to think about efficiencies of crowds or the accuracy of the crowd, I think it could also be quite valuable to think about optimising the possibilities for learning in the crowd. And this would then make crowds smarter, potentially, um, which could lead for benefits to, to people who are interested in the outcomes of that crowdsourcing initiative, but also those engaged in the process. So the way that I've been exploring this issue and, and a, a group of us at the Internet Institute is looking at massive open online courses or MOOCs, which I'm sure many of you have heard lots about. Um, but this allows us to really explore the process of um, learning in semi-formal, semi-organised crowds and see what really happens within these spaces. Um, I'm going to talk more tomorrow about the specifics of our research, but really what we're finding is actually crowds are pretty difficult places for, ple for people to kind of construct and build knowledge, i.e. to learn. Um, and so this often means that both the experience for people, i.e. their processes of learning or their ways of participating in the crowd, but also the outcomes, the knowledge output, if you like, are kind of suboptimal. We could make it better, I think, in many cases. And this is because um, crowds pr present a lot of challenges. If we're interested in not just kind of creating um, very simplistic tasks, but anything more complicated where collaboration of any kind is required. And that's because crowds um, don't self-organize that well. Um, information doesn't really flow that efficiently through networks. People are not that um, able to really work effectively, and that requires quite intelligent design. Often in crowdsourcing, we see people as kind of a homogeneous group who all have similar kind of needs of being there, but actually they're there with very different levels of expertise, different levels of motivation, expectation. We could design systems that better understand those different <coughs> groups within crowds um, and therefore enhance the kind of effectiveness and processes of, of the, the learning process and the outcomes that are then created. Also, people in crowds suffer from information overload, which is something that we all suffer from, but we could actually design systems to really think about how we could make that process better. So I'm really interested in making the crowd smarter, and I think the ways that we can do that are by looking at crowd dynamics, looking at the <coughs> networks within the crowd, how information flows, who is saying what to who, um, who is key in the network for supporting or actually kind of hindering learning of others, um, and developing typologies of people who are participating in those crowds so that we can actually um, support different kinds of learners within the same crowd to increase the kind of optimization of, of, of the practices. So of course this used to be done by people, um, but now the crowd is too big. You know, we can't do it that way. So in our research, we're trying to look at ways of developing kind of real-time intelligent systems that are responsive to the learning needs of the crowd to actually think about the kinds of information people need at certain points and recommend it to them, um, to identify who's at risk of dropping out and ensuring they stay in so their voices can also be heard, um, and also supporting key players who help the learning process. And this approach could potentially maximise the kind of learning potential of a crowd, um, which would lead to more effective learning processes, so more satisfying for the people being participating in these initiatives, but also more positive outcomes for those who've set the crowdsourcing initiative in the first place. But I suppose one of the big risks in education terms is that you could potentially design out serendipity and chance encounters, which are so important in crowd-based environments. So we certainly wouldn't want to do that. There's a kind of balance there. And also, while um, in some situations uh, the crowd can enhance 
opportunities for people to contribute. In education, certainly, we're seeing a lot of inequality in the system, so that those who are better educated, better connected, are the ones who stay and participate, and those who are not tend to drop out. So we, we have problems in education in dealing with those challenges. Anyway, I think what I'm trying to suggest is that, that using ideas from learning and education, we could maximise kind of crowd-based initiatives to benefit both individuals and organisations. Um, and I'd just be very interested in if people think a kind of learning approach rather than a focus um, primarily on efficiency or accuracy could be a useful way forward in some context. Thanks, Rebecca. That's great. Lisa. Thanks. Before I start, I think I need to pick up on that umbrella issue that you raised before and, and really commend the organizers on, on giving out umbrellas. I've been to lots of conferences and we usually get USB sticks and then you go to an internet conference and you get an umbrella which is <laughs> <laughs> so much more useful, to be honest. Like, so keep on doing umbrellas in the, in the years to come. Uh, can you maybe start with like a crowdsourcing experiment, rather purpose-free but just out of curiosity. Can I ask you to all close your eyes for a moment? Um, I'll ask you a question and then I count to three and then I would like you to just shout out the answer, your personal answer to that question. What is the color of corruption? Red. One, Black. two, three. Red. 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 Interesting. <laughs> I, I've been doing this like without the label of crowdsourcing, like in, in, in different settings, and like corruption people, corruption scholars and practitioners usually say black, like there's like 99% black. Here was a lot of red, interestingly, I don't know why, maybe, because the umbrellas are orange, so there's a like, close association. Like, I did it with designers and it was very colorful, it was really all over the place, so. Um, okay, well, um, I'm working for an NGO, Transparency International, that um, um, was founded in 1993, um, so it's um, a bit more than 20 years old, and started out as a um, policy advocacy organization. We do a lot of research on corruption issues. We have chapters, local groups in about 100 countries. Um, and it's fair to say, I think, that in the early years of, of Transparency International, it was very much um, an elite think tank advocacy organization, working with policy wonks on very specific policy issues and basically trying to, to institute policy reforms. Now we've also learned through our, through our research that um, unsurprisingly to, to us, like um, people care a huge amount about corruption. Like uh, you do surveys, like corruption is one of the big issues that people mention. Um, we know that a lot of money goes missing through corruption. We know that a lot of people are touched by corruption. However, we as an NGO working on those issues felt that we're still having a bit of a disconnect between the policy advocacy work that we're deriving from that research and actually the engagement with the people and with this groundswell of, of concern about corruption and the grievances that are, that are being expressed to us. So I think like under the label or when the concept of crowdsourcing like, came along, I think it created a lot of excitement, not just for like, my own organization, but for others that work in that field, to actually um, see a lot of promise in, in a new crop of tools that might help us engage in, in, in very new ways with people and rope them more practically into the fight against corruption. Um, and if I um, was asked to maybe just kind of characterize the, the kind of spectrum of initiatives that have emerged since then, it's maybe um, in a very simplified way one could have like on one stylized end of the spectrum um, all those initiatives that invite people to enhance transparency of a specific project, of a specific issue, to um, basically disclose corruption risks. Um, this ranges from um, monitoring contracts, procurement contracts, that for example, an initiative in Rus Russia very successfully puts online and invites people to go through those contracts and see if there's any kind of strange mismatch of, of funds and some overpricing going on and has actually discovered a lot of um, irregularities that way. Um, to people who map um, very material relationships between business and government, who um, basically crowdsource the asset disclosure profiles of, of senior officials in countries where those profiles are not available online, and so on and so on. So we have on one end of the spectrum a lot of monitoring, a lot of transparency generating and oversight generating mechanisms where people are invited for a specific purpose to, to come in and, and help with the fight against corruption. And then on the kind of other end of the spectrum, again very stylized, we have like this open-ended um, 
um, crop of platforms that invite people to report on, on corruption issues. I paid a bribe in India is one example, probably the best known example, but um, using some of the most prominent crowdsourcing tools like Ushahidi, like the, the Fix My Street or C-Click Fix, C -click Fix platform from the US, there are a lot of um, those platforms all over the world that are also like dedicated to um, um, getting people to report on corruption and my paper tomorrow will be about that um, type of initiatives and I think there is a lot of hybrids in between that spectrum between the open-ended um, reporting channel that is that's being facilitated um, and then the, the kind of more targeted engagement of people on specific um, projects um, I think uh, and this is a of course too big of a question to answer and it's very early I think um, those projects, some of them have moved the needle in the fight against corruption um, quite a bit. As I said, there is um, lots of evidence, that anecdotal evidence, that some of those platforms have managed to expose irregularities, have found that politicians in Colombia are misusing public resources to, to campaign, and, and so on and so on. So like, you could come up with a, with a very kind of impressive list of examples. Um, I guess what we also um, could plausibly suggest is that um, this type of uh, bringing um, on the other end of the spectrum the crowd reporting into, into, the, into the light and exposing the, the scale and scope of bribe paying that, that people do um, when they report on, on those issues helps to, to break that, um, that notion of pluralistic ignorance that there is kind of a silent majority accepting a certain practice such as bribe paying um, and then it turns out that people are actually very fed up with it and then really take that step and, and put, their, put their voice out there and report on corruption issues. So like one could plausibly argue that there's a kind of an empowering effect coming with this that breaks that notion of pluralistic ignorance, that there's a norm that is actually not, not very accepted, although not very common. Um, there are lots of challenges. Um, there are some that I think are, are being addressed quite actively and with a lot of progress in relation to the privacy of, of, of uh, the users, in relation to the security of the platforms, also in sensitive environments. There are a lot of NGOs that provide this type of support services to organizations like, like ours. Um, um, but then again, there are also, I, I think, uh, some challenges out there that, that we still need to really um, think about and work on. Sustainability, of course, is, is like a big, big issue. So um, for those crowd reporting platforms, we, we see like a typical pattern that setting up the platform is quite easy, maybe not even so expensive. Maybe even the first promotional media bus is, is not so difficult to engineer and you get a kind of a, a groundswell of, of people coming and using the platform and reporting. But then we, we tend to see in, in many situations a drop off of, of usage. And, and it's, it's difficult to sustain the engagement of people over time. And I think we need to think hard about how we can um, design and encourage like, a sustainable engagement. Um, another, another issue, again, on the crowd reporting end is like you could say pluralistic ignorance and the, the breaking open of, of the reporting is empowering. But at the same time, you could argue the other way around, that it's actually kind of making salience like a, a practice that is out there, that there seems to be no obvious solution to, and then basically locking everyone into like a collective action dilemma that if I see that all the other parents are bribing their teachers big time, I want to get my kids through school also in a, in a good way, so I'm going to join that bandwagon. And so it, it could lead to reinforcement of some, of some very bad practices and norms if, if the platforms are, are badly designed. And I think we haven't really um, taken that consideration so much into account. Um, I want to just leave you finally with a couple of ideas of like where this type of crowdsourcing for anti-corruption could, could go next uh, or is already kind of moving towards. Um, one is, and um, before doing this work uh, for an anti-corruption organization, I worked on technology, and so we recently mapped a little bit in a kind of very simple typology, like what a kind of crowd reporting platform looks like. So you have a hub in the middle that's run by an organization like TI, and then people report to it, and it's the spokes, right? Hub and spokes. It's the, the plain old telephone system, right? This is kind of the sketch that people drew before the internet to kind of juxtapose like what the internet architecture looks like with the plain old telephone system. And somehow it feels almost that we are stuck in that, in that um, time still with crowd reporting where we have a lot of hub and spoke models and we're not tapping into the opportunities of using that type of reporting that people do as a social discovery mechanism 
sufficiently enough and basically link people up among each other that have uh, common grievances or, or common issues. So I think we need to somehow mesh that, that whole system more and get away from that hub and spoke system. And, and final idea, and, and this is something that I've uh, been promoting over the last one and a half years inside and outside our organization, I think we need to go um, out into the, I don't want to call it real world, but we need to go out into the physical space more with the kind of the energy and the commitments and the reporting and the information that, that we kind of generate through that type of crowdsourcing. So the question would be, how can you bring those feedback loops that you generate on government services, on, on corruption issues, how can you bring this back into the, into the public space, into the physical space, perhaps confront the institutions that are the targets of those complaints more directly in public space with that information and then really see what kind of dynamics evolve around this like and how people that are kind of juxtaposed by that type of information but also the reporters and it would be very interesting to do more experiments and think a little bit more about what could be done in that area what what kind of things could be tried out because i think that's how we need to channel that energy that is now mainly living online still like back into the into the physical space Thank you, Dieter. Very interesting. Do you think that, I mean, I guess there is one question that applies to all these fields, which is, does, uh, does this mean that uh, uh, utopian ideas about citizens being more involved in policy making and governance, I mean, where's the best hope for that? It sounded from what you were all saying that perhaps Dieter was offering the best, <laughs> the best hope. What, 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 what do you, you guys think? What does anybody think in terms of? I mean, I, I think it's it's tricky. I think it all depends on the design of the system and, and, and really thinking about the social aspects of these spaces. Because I think in, in learning and education, anyway, a lot of people start a lot of initiatives who you wouldn't normally expect, who may not have very strong education backgrounds and so on, but they often drop out. So they, they leave fast. And so somehow if we could design in awareness of these things, then we could definitely expand the base, I think, of, of participation. But it needs very careful design, I think. Does it depend in some way on the good being provided? I mean, if it's a kind of public good, I mean, if it's a private good, then, or, or a kind of quasi-private good, if it's, if it's fixed by street.com mm. or C-click mm. fix, then somebody's got another motivation to do it because they want the, their own street fix. Mm. <laughs> but it happens to be everybody else's. <laughs> Street. Of course, um, what you often see with crowdfunding is that people then attach to that public good some kind of a private good, the perks that you get. If you donate enough money, you get your, you know, your, your badge of honor or something like that. You're basically selling that private good and raising money for the public good whilst doing that. Yeah. I, I thought that um, you, could, you could characterize police corruption as a form of, of crowdfunding. So they've gotten rid of this uh, you know, hierarchy where the money and orders come from above and instead get their instructions and their funding directly from the people. Well, <laughs> in a corrupted place, that would be a threat. So, I suppose. so sorry? In a, in, a, in a corrupted place environment, that would be a threat because the police then would get the money from... Uh, the, the criminals. I mean, yeah, I'm not advocating it I mean, as, as a good, <laughs> good practice, but I'm, 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 I'm saying that this is, this is kind of why we need to be a bit wary about the, what are good forms of crowdfunding and bad forms of crowdfunding. But I think crowdfunding is a nice example because it links all these perspectives. The crowdfunding of uh, education for people who can't afford mm -hmm. education, I think, is a great way in which people can um, um, get active and, and do something uh, in a country where you know, I'm from Finland and we fund uh, education by taxes and I think that works re reasonably well. But in a country where that's not politically feasible, then people can do at least something. They can you know, come up with an alternative mechanism of funding um, uh, those who can't afford their education. Yeah, I agree. I mean, even in politics, crowdfunding has been always very successful because in this way, a uh, campaign was run with funded by coming from citizens, so that's usually good. Although there are, it might be also the case when the, the funding is not equally distributed among mm. citizens. So you have uh, somebody that will be more generous than others and then in some way can, can kind of uh, control the campaign as well. So. But I mean, it's been, it's been quite successful. But I mean, these are the traditional questions of politics, collective action, public goods, aren't they? I mean, you, you know, some goods seem to 
and being very, you know, the environment is still <laughs> shot to pieces. I mean, some goods are very, very difficult to provide because of the precise dynamic of that good. And it's sounding as if it's the same when you talk about designing selective incentives into any sort of crowdsourcing, then we're, this is the traditional way to overcome the logic of collective action, isn't it? So yeah. I mean, in, in politics, I can add also, there is the, sometimes uh, the risk is to be too ambitious. I mean, the, the Icelandic parliament uh, recently have just launched uh, what they claim to be the first uh, crowdsourced constitution. And um, apparently they failed because, of course, it's difficult to ask it to the whole population to, to be expert on, uh, on uh, specific mm -hmm. things. I mean, uh, this, uh, the, the, the idea of uh, uh, that everybody is al allowed to be expert and say something on some specific issues uh, is not necessarily successful. So it's, it's good to find a good equilibrium between opportunities and, uh, and uh, not be too extreme and pretending cross-sourcing is going to solve everything, I suppose. Were you going to add something No, I, I, I think your point about the police corruption, I think, probably triggered some interesting perspective on this. I, I think it's, it's, all, it's one thing to always look at, like, what does the system, crowdsourcing system, look like under Ceteris Haribus, like, with, without the, the, the environment changing. But I think this interplay then with, with the economic and the political system that you also talked about, alluded to, with the, the research funding being, being uh, now, like, uh, reduced. It's very interesting. So with the police corruption, for example, of course the system is taking this into account. And we know that people don't top up their salaries like that are too low with, uh, with the additional bribe paying. They're actually buying the job because their superiors know that they, they, they can basically recoup that investment, take a cut, and it goes up into the party coffers in a kind of pyramid scheme. So the, the kind of system is kind of anticipating the type of um, rent seeking that is possible at that level. And I think it would be interesting like, to see like, the, the, what crowdsourcing does in that kind of like, interplay with the system. So for us, we're trying to kind of stimulate that discussion with governments where we kind of offer it as a conversation tool. We're saying, here's a reporting platform that we are running. Um, it's done on the local newspaper maybe to get more visibility. They, they also like it. But then we invite the government, a bit like the Fix My Street model, right, to kind of really come in, comment on it, use it as a kind of almost like a scorecard for what they're doing in the case they're closing. So, that kind of interplay, I think, is, is, is the very interesting part then, like in the long run, what, what happens there. Okay, well, we need, we're going to move on now to our keynote speaker. I'd like to thank all the panelists um, very much for sort of laying out some of the landscape um, for the next two days. So, thank you very much.